Hello, my name is Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of the book you see in front of you, Modifying the Aerodynamics of Your Road Car. What I want to do in today's video is talk about an extraordinary 1930s streamliner car called the Bernie Streamliner. But before we look at that car, it really makes sense if we have some sort of context. The Bernie Streamliner wasn't the first streamlined passenger car. Here's the Tropfen Wagon of 1921, an extraordinary car that I've been lucky enough to see in the flesh, drag coefficient in the high point twos. And then here is the Tatra 77, the T77, which again was an extremely aerodynamically slippery car, and that came out in 1934. But these cars were just a massive exception. Here's a, a more realistic example of what a car looked like in the mid-1930s. Now, some people describe these cars as streamlined, but they're not at all. Sure, they're the teardrop front headlights and there's the curved guards, but look at the angle of the windscreen and look at how big the wake area must be behind the car, because it's the rear of the car that in many cases determines the majority of the drag. So this is what cars typically look like, and this was probably a fairly sophisticated looking car. So what was the Bernie Streamliner like? Well, before we get to it, so Deniston Burney himself had worked on the R100 airship. Well, he was actually the director of the company responsible. And while people these days poo-poo airships, you know, dead-end technology and a floating bomb and all the rest of it, actually, they are extraordinarily high-tech for the time. They used aluminium framework with inside the dirigible. They used very high technology in terms of the design and manufacture. But of course, airships did prove to be a dead end. And when the R100 was broken up for scrap, Sir Deniston Burney turned his attention to streamlined cars. And of course, airships were extraordinarily well streamlined. Here's an example of his car. And doesn't it look just so different to the Ford we saw a moment ago? Look at that nose, that laid back windscreen angle, still a flat pane of glass. Look at how the tail, it curves all the way down, having a attached flow over the roof. Look at the transition between the windscreen and the roof and how smooth that is. But conversely, look at how sharp the transition is around the A-pillar. So it wasn't perfect in every respect. 13 of these cars were built, each one being slightly different. The starting point was an Alvis chassis that was turned back to front, so placing the engine at the extreme rear of the car, extreme rear, the engine, as you'll see in a moment, is hung right out the back. Suspension, both front and rear, was independent, so incredibly modern for the time. And front suspension used a single transverse leaf spring, and the rear suspension used two transverse leafs, and there was a full underbody under tray all the way along. Here's a cutaway view of the car. Now, some things to notice is the engine. Look where the engine is. Yes, it's right out the back. Now, these days we might worry about polar moments of inertia and the, the rear overtaking the front in massive oversteer. But at the time, putting an engine out the back was seen as, as a very innovative and very useful because it left so much room in, the, in between the wheel lines, the, the axle lines, to actually put people. And these were very large cars inside. Um, it was about 20 feet long, the car itself, so very long. Um, front track being five feet wide, rear track being narrower at uh, about four feet, eight inches. Uh, seven people could sit in these cars. Now, other things to notice are those transverse leaf springs that I talked about a moment ago. The fact that it's a fabric body, which has uh, echoes of the airship, doesn't it? The airships used fabric coverings. Uh, but And look at that... Uh, that line towards the back of the car. Look at how attached flow would occur all the way along that roof. So giving a smaller wake area and probably smaller drag. Now you can see that engine. Now, this is a very, very interesting picture. It's a straight eight twin cam, and doesn't it look modern, those twin cams, of three liters. And it was provided by an external engine uh, manufacturer called Beverly Barnes. It was liquid cooled with a radiator each side of the engine. Now notice the scoop above the rear wheel. So that's where the radiator is placed inside that scoop. But notice the exit airflow louvers. Uh, aren't they modern? The air would be coming out of those radiators and wouldn't just be gushing out under the car. It's actually coming out and uh, sliding down the surface of the side of the car. 
very much aircraft design of the period. Drive was the rear wheels, a four speed gearbox was used, and at the front, under that short nose, there were two batteries and a 14 gallon fuel tank. Here's what it looks like in traffic, and wouldn't that be startling? No wonder people were uh, both staring at the camera and also staring at the car. It had a claimed cruising speed, cruising speed, mind you, of 70 miles an hour, 120 kilometres an hour, uh, asking price of £1,500. Then it was about the same price as a luxury car like an eight-cylinder Lincoln. It didn't go very well, though, commercially. As I say, only 13 were built. It was shown to Rolls-Royce, who appeared interested, but they probably appeared interested in lots of weird and wonderful cars. And it was fitted with a 4.4 litre Lycoming six cylinder engine and taken to the US uh, to see if any manufacturers could be made interested. GM was apparently interested at one stage, but nothing major occurred. Unfortunately, the end of the, the car was rather dismal. It was bought by a company called Crosley and they powered it with a two litre engine. But unfortunately, they also put a traditional 1930s front on the, on the car with radiator and the whole lot which looked pretty awful and only 25 of those cars were built the book's called modifying the aerodynamics of your road car i don't cover the bernie streamliner in it but i have a whole chapter looking at significant aerodynamic cars going right back to the 1920s tropfenwagen modifying the aerodynamics of your road car the book's out now thank you